so I just want to say hi to everyone and, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Camlin, and, and on behalf of the Society of Printers, uh, uh, I do welcome you to um, our January event uh, with John T. Hill. Uh, the Society of Printers was formed in 1905 by Boston-based designers, typographers, printers, and other proponents of the arts and crafts movement in printing and the book arts. In non-pandemic times, we meet privately over dinner on Beacon Hill to enjoy not only each other's company, but also presentations by respected experts and luminaries from the many disciplines of our concern, including literate design, printing history, typography, publishing, and more. In a year marked by isolation, we are opening our meetings to the wider design, typographic, and printing community to offer a vehicle for the sort of connections and discussions that our organization values so much. If you're interested in learning more about the society or making a donation to support this programming, you can visit our website or contact our governing council at secretary at societyofprinters.org. Uh, and I'm gonna ask the audience members to remain on mute and enter any questions you might have for John uh, to be answered at the end of the conclusion of tonight's presentation. I should say enter them in uh, the chat feature on Zoom. Um, and then we can we can address those at the end. Um, uh, and uh, finally, it's it's my pleasure to introduce Christopher Pullman, who will in turn inter be introducing our guest for the evening, uh, John T. Hill. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for all coming. Our speaker tonight, uh, John Hill, is somebody that I've known and been pals with ever since the mid 60s when, uh, when I ended up at Yale in the MFA program, which at that time, interestingly, was called Graphic Design and Photography. Uh, John had graduated from this program in 1960, and when I arrived, he was already a skilled photographer working professionally and also teaching at Yale alongside Herbert Matter and later Walker Evans. When it was decided sometime around 1971 to split these two disciplines, it was John who co-founded Yale's first department of photography. Now tonight, as he will explain, over time, he sort of magically morphed into a unique combination of photographer, graphic designer, exhibit designer, researcher, author, and ultimately master bookmaker. He says that he has rarely produced a book in less than a year, mainly because of the drive to research and collect material related to his subject. And I have to say, or he has to say, it's also because of his obsession to control the entire bookmaking process. An added benefit of this obsession was that these personal projects have helped document the work of many of his friends, teaching colleagues, and heroes. John's gregarious spirit, incredible memory, eclectic interests, and enviable role decks have contributed to his success at roping together the best and brightest in the world of photography, printing, and publishing, a collaboration that ultimately makes these beautiful and personal books possible. My wife Esther and I have had fun watching him gradually reinvent himself in this way. And I think you'll have a treat hearing how it happened and what he has learned from the process. So please welcome for this Society of Printers talk, our friend, John T. Hill. Hold on, go. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be talking, actually preaching to the choir, and at least it's the most, um, advanced choir and the choir certainly outstrips the speaker in terms of experience and knowledge but i'm honored to be here and i hope that i can find something to say much of which i'm sure you've known for years but perhaps there are a few new a few different things um there are a few points that i'd like to talk about in the beginning and one is book making versus 
book design, I think independent people who make books, and I'm certainly not alone in that, will certainly um, identify with this. But if you're making a book, you certainly have to keep in mind that, that design is a great part of that. But in a greater, uh, the greater part of the picture, it has to do a lot with how much you can control. And I think as a bookmaker, you should grab as much power and as much control over as many aspects of the project as possible. I, uh, I find that very helpful. And, and I know that it's not popular with working for publishers and all that. And that's one reason that I choose to work independently. But it has its, you know, it has its pluses and its minuses. Um, in talking about the design of the book, I think that the, go the goal of the designer is very important. I think that the, to set out to make a book that's a piece of art or artful and all that is a little bit wrong-headed. I think the first thing you really need to do is make a book that's legible and accessible and one that is showing off the subject matter as well as could be expected. If later it becomes uh, an object of, of more art, more worthy of being called art, then let that be. But I think that cannot be. I think it is not uh, a time for a graphic design tour de force or the sort of the deep self-expression that I see in so many books today, but I think you really have to keep in mind that presenting the subject as clearly as you can is is your first goal. And that involves you know, the selecting fonts, which have so many subtleties and dialects and colors built into them, and how you use them and what size and what what line width, and is it ragged right? Is it, is it gridded? Is it not gridded? There's so many things that go into the decisions of making a book. Uh, but I find that to make bodies of type and images go together in a compatible way so they don't conflict, and they don't bump into each other literally or, or you know, in, in any way is, is the first thing that I really want to do. Uh, I'd like to begin by talking about the earliest book that I had anything to do with and in um in 1951-52 uh, well first i'd like to read this quote it's one that we all know but i think it's worth repeating and it's no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money that's dr samuel johnson in a very sort of uh, mercenary mood but i have rather turn that out on my head on its head and, and everything that I've done I the best things that I have done and the things that I enjoyed most are those that I would pay to, to the pleasure of doing if that were the case and I I have occasionally been paid for doing a book but it's been very rare uh, the uh, how do we change this Ah, okay. In 1951-52, uh, uh, I was in high school in Marietta, Georgia, and I was somehow was given the job of being the art director for the school an annual. And as long as I could remember, there had been soft padded uh, vinyl covered albums that looked a lot like photo albums from the Victorian period with satin and uh, velvet and I was determined to have something a little bit more hard-edged, and so I selected a, a raw canvas cover, and I selected what I thought at the time was a, a typeface that looked very modern and was in keeping with what I thought that our high school should look like. And it turns out, with Chris Pullman's help, that this is, this is a, a typeface design in 1927 by Rudolf Koch, and it's called Cobble. And it's exactly the same age, almost exactly as, as, as Futura, which is another type that I like very much. Um, I, uh, 
I learned a lot in doing this, and I got a little bit of a taste for what it would be like to do uh, do books. Um, in the same year, 1952, I became an undergraduate at University of Georgia, who happened to have one of the best art departments in the country at the time. And part of that reason was the brilliance of Lamar Dodd, the administrator of um, the department. But it was also his foresight in hiring Alan, excuse me, Alvin Lustig to come and design, a, to draw up a curriculum. And he dis, did this because he knew that very shortly before that, Joseph Albers had invited Alvin Lustig to come and draw up the curriculum for the study of the famous school at Black Mountain. So that was, that laid the bedrock for the way the school was put together and the faculty was put together. Um, it was it was a very well known art department. A Life magazine sent a crew down to photograph one of the avant-garde teaching techniques. It was developed by Dr. Erwin Breithaupt, who uh, was a scholar of um, visual perception, and it really was a, a class that changed my mind. But another faculty member. Uh, Professor Wiley Sanderson one day brought a book to class and it was something that I had never seen anything like and it, it made a deep impression on me and this is a book that you probably know it's called Ballet there were 500 copies of this printed it's designed by Alexei Brodovich in 1945 and it's based on his photographs and his sensibility about Victorian typefaces and how they might be used to give meaning to the titles of these ballets. So I think the typography was fresh and new, and then you see it ju juxtaposed with his photographs, which were very stark and grainy and technically sort of immature, but brilliant in the way they were put together. And the way he used two pages and the impact that that has, I think, had a great, uh, it had a great meaning for me. And I also think that this book had a great meaning for Herbert Matter, who at the time in 1945 was working for Alexei Brodovich in New York uh, in his job as art director for Condé Nast. Um, these um, are, I think, beautiful juxtapositions, and I, I never get tired of looking at them. So, after that, I, after I had graduated and had gone to the army for a couple of years, I did finally come to study with Herbert Matter. As an undergraduate at, at UGA, I had two people that I wanted to study with, Herbert Matter and Alvin Lustig. And Lustig died shortly before I, I came to Yale, but Herbert was there very much. And the title that I gave this, event tonight was what I learned from Herbert Matter about book design was a little bit tongue-in-cheek because Herbert Matter actually never told me anything about book design. Whatever I learned from him was by example and for 25 years um, he um, this is this is relative to the 25 year period. Thou knowest we work by wit and not by witchcraft and wit depends on dilatory time well, Herbert decided that 25 years was uh, sufficient dilatory time, and he finally, he finally put it together. But let me show you once again the jacket of the book. It's it's perfect uh, example of the simplicity and the elegance, and the way that Herbert and Norman Ives could reduce things to their most basic elements. He begins the book with a series of things that would appear to be unrelated, but actually they're very much related. His idea was that Giacometti grew up in Switzerland on the Italian border, and the mountains and the forest and all of that, and the imagery of that, he felt was relevant to Giacometti's work. He spent quite a long time in, in Paris photographing in the studio of Giacometti. And so you see all the chaos you see dozens of pro uh, projects that are still in the making. They're under wraps. You see paintings on the wall. It was just a wonderful insight into how Giacometti worked. 
Herbert was very interested in sequences and progressions and these six figures, all that are probably no more than six or eight inches tall, fascinated him and they make such a graphic presentation. This is called Dying Man and it looks very much like one of the spreads in, in ballet. I think it's a, one of the most strongest images. They're so simple and they're so powerful and they engage all, all the edges and the excitement you get from full bleeds. This is Diego Rivera, brother of Alberto, who was also a very good artist. Herbert also knew how to explore painting and the details of the painting and how to make these things work together. It's a brilliant book and I think it's uh, one that even though it's pictures and there's very there's a lot of text in the back but the typography is really not the point of it. it's how it's how the how much power he could get out of juxtaposing and making these images fill and activate a spread um walker evans and i became friends when we met in herbert matter introduced me to walker evans in 1961 and then uh, Walker came to Yale in 1964, and he gave, um, well, and that's really comes later, but when he died in um, 1975, in April, uh, I suddenly realized that I had agreed to be the executor of his estate, um, and it suddenly weighed heavily on my, on my, on my desk and on my shoulders. And I thought, here's a chance to redirect the whole perception of Walker Evans, who had been pigeonholed as a documentary photographer of poverty in the South. And I thought that was the last thing in the world he should be tagged as. And so I set about how we can reshape that and turn that around. Francis Lindley, who was a senior editor at Harper and Rowe had helped Walker do the 1938 book of American Photographs. And she'd also helped him in, in making um, the Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. She was a genius at production. She had a wonderful eye. And I don't know, I've never, I've rarely met anybody more helpful than smarter. And so we were, I was blessed with working with her to produce his first book. Uh, of course, you're doing a photography book, and the question is, do you do type or do you do a photograph on the cover? And taking the lead from Evans uh, American Photographs, I decided to go with type. So this is some handset wall bomb that was done on a proof press with the help of George Shakespeare and, and, the, um, and the Yale School of Design. And I uh, struggled very hard to get this accepted as a cover. The first proposed cover was calligraphy, very elegant calligraphy um, that was popular in the 50s and 40s. Um, so there is essentially no text. This is strictly a picture book. So you need to find a way to get as much as you can. I, I, was, I was absolutely convinced that I had to use pictures on two pages. I could not have the luxury of one picture on a spread as Walker had done. And you really immediately recognize that these two pictures, whatever two pictures you put on there, have a conversation going. And it, they either enhance each other or they destroy each other. And so I spent over a year shuffling these things around and Originally, Norman Ives had been given the job of designing this, and he was the best at sequencing that everybody knew. But unfortunately, Norman died before this book really got off the ground. Uh, but I was very fortunate having Thomas Todd, printer in Boston, who made a wonderful job of this book. And he and I sat on the press, and I thought it was a very elegant piece of printing. This one photograph sort of cap is a capsule of all of Walker's aesthetics and its vernacular art, its appropriation of art, its collection of posters and 
it's it just has everything that Walker loved in it, and it has a word in it. He loved type, and he knew a lot about type. I wanted to make sure that we had included work that was after the well-known work from FSA. And when he was hired by Fortune magazine in 1945, a lot of people said he sold out and it was over. But if you look at the work, he really continued to generate very interesting projects and, and he was innovative and to recognize the aesthetic value and the intrinsic value of many layers of value of the common tool was that was exactly his gift to, to find objects of that sort. Um, you know, about three or four years after that, Francis Lindley and I decided, or I decided that there needed to be a book showing his process. Students had for some time had access to all the contact sheets, but then that window closed and I felt that we had to do a workbook and it was not to be an art book, but it was to be a book explaining his process as much as we could. So we spent, well, I mean, about two years collecting not only photographs, but writings and unpublished notes that he made. And I think in a way it's the most satisfying book of all. And it really is the, the structure and the, 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 the kernel of, the two other books that I've done on him. This is Walker in Darien, Connecticut in 1927, where he rented a small house and was having had a flower garden in the back. These are early studies, somewhat abstract, that he did of a conch shell. Not nobody would ever dream of Evans having done this. This is a series of 35 millimeter things from FSA. Um, only one of these, I, well, maybe two of them made their way into Let Us Know, Praise Famous Men. But to see all four um, images of Allie Mae Burroughs together and to see the fact that he cut one of the negatives is really a, a, a very interesting bit of teaching. So this is husband and wife and their daughter. And the one on the upper left of, of Allie Mae is taken with open flash. And that was the one that appeared in American Photographs. But this picture sort of lets you look behind the curtain and see just how he valued a negative. He was, he had a, Bernie Savitt was his friend and he knew that she had a five by seven and larger. So he would take his eight by 10 negatives, cut a five by seven fragment That's a over and make it larger. Start video. What's that? Zoom would like to access the camera. Okay. What's going on? You don't have your speaker on. You can't hear it because you shut Famous your speaker his, off. You mute yourself. Yeah. Sure. This is Walker Evans, Havana, and in, in, in 1933. Um, it was his first assignment that uh, where he really had control of it and he took full advantage of it. It was sort of a, a, a chance for him to take his, what he had learned from Eugene Ache and take it on the road and give it a, a, a spin. He took two cameras to um, uh, Havana and Cuba and traveled all over with. This book was um, a collaboration between Carla Miller and me and um, I'm very pleased to have worked with her. She's a, 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 she was not a student of Norm. She was a graduate of the Yale program, but she's a wonderful, person, great designer. Um, um, I think the Cuba stuff is a real revelation and it had not been seen before as a, as a separate body. Gilles Marat uh, had come from France and asked if he could do a book to we could do a book together and at the time he was working with a, a publisher in France called Contre Jour and they were willing to do this book and they co-published it with Pantheon in New York and it was quite a successful book with Pantheon. 
Um, I think it's a gem, and I'm very pleased. I did this. I did the editing and the sequencing, and anyway, I'm 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 glad to have that as a, a separate body of work. Um, based on that, uh, Zhu Mora, partly based on that, he became connected with Les Editions du Soi in Paris, one of the old venerable houses, and we were beginning to do picture books again. And he decided that he and I could do a, a comprehensive book of uh, Evan's work. Uh, the title, which is my, well, it's my borrowing from Evans, but in an interview with Paul Cummings for Archive of American Artists, he uh, said, I go to the street for my eye because my eye is hungry. So I thought that was a fitting title. This time I worked again with, with Judy Cohn, who um, was a student of Norman's and a student of mine. And she was a well-established designer in Boston, had just done an incredible job with a Harvard anniversary, 300 year anniversary book with many, many photographs and details that all worked together perfectly. And I felt she had the experience with digital design and we worked together. Uh, flawlessly. I was very lucky to have a colleague to take the, uh, really, the, all the heat it went with the design. The photograph on the back is by Jerry Thompson, Walker's student and assistant. I believe the front, the front piece is, uh, the front jacket is um, a self-portrait. One of the earliest things, the earliest jobs he has was a travel photographer for a rich man who was sailing to Tahiti from New York. And so Walker at the time took a movie camera, uh, a 35 millimeter camera and a six by nine camera. And he really had quite a good time, but very little um, of his best work came out of that. There's a lot of technical problems. He had once also wanted to be a filmmaker and you see some of the outtakes of that. This is a series of photographs that were really funded by Lincoln Kirstein, who wanted to preserve a record of Victorian architecture. This is Saratoga Springs, it's one of the famous. It's a very interesting photograph because it's easy to think of as a pictorial sort of rainy day in Paris or foggy day in London. And then you suddenly look at it and you realize it's all about cars. It's all about streets and wet streets and how this river of cars is running along and it's, it has all of the Evans elements in it. There's signs on the buildings on, on the left. Um, when he was working for the FSA, he took the advantage of the chance and he started doing monuments. And I think it gave the Friedlander license to do monuments as well. And these are, these are cropped versions. Some, one or two of these are made into postcards, but uh, this is an unknown series of things he did with an uh, African-American preacher in Florida. One of the interior photographs made its way into, into the 1938 book, American Photographs. This is uh, 1941 in Florida, the Mangrove Coast. Um, uh, Le Soy, Les Editions of Le Soy, rather liked the uh, book and it was it was co-published the Evans book was co-published by Harry Abrams and Shermer Mosel and Timson Hudson in London so it, it it had a very good run and it stayed in print for quite a long time given that success we were asked to do a book on Edward Weston so we knew that the archive was at Center for Creative Photography in Tucson so we spent quite a long time there, and I, I realized as wonderful as it was that we really need more material. And the last thing a publisher wants to hear is that you want to do more research. But I, I knew that the MFA in Boston had a wonderful collection of, of the Lane from the Lane family. And so I called Ted Stebbins and we went there and started a conversation with him about it. And it took another year, it added a year to it, but it, it made the book a great deal fuller and, and richer. 
this happens to be the French edition. I couldn't find my English edition. I was determined to do this in Futura, and I, I looked high and low for Futura with old style numerals. And Alvin had told me that when he was studying with Ray Nash in Dartmouth, that there in the type shop was a, uh, a font with old style numerals in Futura. I called all the big, big houses, type houses in New York. Nobody had ever heard of this. And I kept looking, and then after about six months, I had a note from Chris Pullman, who said, if you go online, you can buy Renner Archetype for 1995. And I did that, and this book, and at least one other book that we're going to look at, is set in Renner Archetype. I like the texture of it. I like the look of it. it it's a period that's coincides with the work of um, Edward Weston, and I thought it made a perfect fit. This is Tina Madotti, his lover and co-artist. She was in her own right a, a very capable artist. We tried to show a lot of the best known and some of the least known shots of Edward Weston. I, I could have gone on for another year on working on this. It could have been much better. My brother happened to um, meet Walker Evans and they, uh, my brother was a dentist and Walker was in need of dental work and they worked out an exchange. My brother wound up owning, but he already had quite a good collection of Walker Evans or photographs in general. And then he increased his collection quite a lot in exchange for the dental work he did on, for Walker. Walker stayed with him for about a month. So the Hyde Museum of Art gave an ex exhibition of this collection and they wanted a catalog to go with that. And I don't know how I managed, but I got the job to design this. They had thought that they would self-publish at the Hyde Museum and I said, this is, this can go more farther than this. And I, I got in touch with Harry Abrams and or Robert Morton and Har Harry Abrams who had been, uh, so good about the Giacometti book, and they immediately took it as a co-publish. Uh, one of the interesting things about this was it was going to be printed in China, so my brother and I decided we'd go to China and be on press because we'd never been to China. So we went for three days and stayed in Buji, which is uh, over the, it's in mainland China and Tianjin, that commercial area. And I'm sure that we had little or anything to do with the quality of the printing, but it was very interesting to see how it worked. Um, it's a small book, but it's a little gym, I think. And the AIGA liked it so much they called it a 50, one of their 50 books of that year. This is a book I did for Richard Balzer. He was a, a student in the law school here at Yale, and he and I were friends. He took my photography course, and we became very good friends. A very good photographer, but he was also a collector of of ephemera, and he specialized in peep shows and the history of peep shows. This was back before peep shows had any any sort of sex or almost no sex in them, and. Peep shows were a phenomenon that went around the world within about six months. Everybody in China and India and all over the world had peep shows because they were very easy to, to make and you could put it on your back and walk from town to town. Uh, this is another uh, Lasoy job. Um, Eugene Smith had been a, a, a really a, my, my main I, was, I thought he was the best photographer for quite a long time. And he had a reputation for being um, completely uh, neutral, not changing anything and all that. And after we went to, again to the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, and once you look at the contact sheets, you realize how much detailed um, 
control he had over this. He would have the same scene repeated four or five times to get it the way he wanted it. It was just amazing. Plus, you realize that he was adding, he'd, he'd studied theatrical lighting. So he took lots of lights, little lights that were in corners and hidden all over the place, and he manipulated everything. It was really quite amazing. This is Spain. It's a series he did, I think, for Life magazine. Anyway, it was a good book. It was printed by Pizzi, as most of these Lasoy books were. Pizzi in just outside Milan, and they at the time were printing a lot of picture books from museums and publishers. And I think they did really quite a good job. Um, I had always thought that the um, in my pursuit of getting Evans out of the pigeonhole of uh, poverty in the South and all that, I wanted to do a book devoted just to the Farm Security Administration material and show that it really was not all about poverty at all. Uh, when Walker first came to Yale, the evening um, in March of 1964, he gave a lecture and it was his, the only lecture he ever gave at Yale. And in it, he talked about naming what his process was. And he had toyed with it for years about what do I call what I'm doing? And he had finally come up with two words, lyric and documentary. And it was really a yin and yang. It was a wonderful solution. It was Walker at his best having it both ways. And it's the, the lecture was illustrated quite a lot. This is the jacket. It's the detail from the penny picture display that I showed you later. And I wrapped it around the front and back. This is a quote from Mark Twain that I think relates to this because the editing was such an important part of how this book came out. A successful book is not made of what's in it, but is, is left out of it. And that's, as we all know, very true. This is a picture of Evans taken by Peter Secure in Mississippi. And I'm sure that this was very carefully posed and orchestrated by the man himself. Um, in the lecture, he gave a lot of slides and a lot of lectures, and a lot of it were anatomical drawings, um, architectural drawings, maps, and everything else, which he had declared um, lyric and documentary all in one. These were vernacular pieces that he, uh, he selected and, and valued. These are two Civil War photographs taken by Alexander Gardner. Walker has been a great uh, admirer of the body of work that was referred to as Matthew Brady, although little, or if any of it, was done by Matthew Brady. But anyway, the simplicity of it and the clarity of it, I think, appealed to Walker. It was, to some extent, very much like the Ache, Eugene Ache material. This is the first job he did for the FSA. It was assignment in West Virginia. This is the 4th of July in uh, West Virginia. This is Atlanta, 1936. You see how important movies were as an escape from what was going on in 1936. This is Ponce de Leon Avenue in Atlanta. I know where this is. This is interesting because it's Selma, Alabama, and he has an eight by 10 camera. It could be a Saturday afternoon. And he takes two eight by 10 negatives and they were almost seamless. So I could not resist juxtaposing them and putting them together like this. And I, I, I did that several other times. He loved churches and he loved vernacular architecture. Alex Harris is a wonderful photographer. He's one of the co-founders of a Center for Documentary Studies at Duke. And he was Walker's student and my student. 
And he had been going to Cuba and documenting various aspects of it for quite a few years. And he came to me and said, well, I help me make a book. And we worked together with his terrific pictures. Uh, they Technically, they were wonderful. They were just beautifully made. And we made quite a good book. And it was, I think it was named best documentary book of the year. Alex is a, is a very, very under, uh, underrated photographer, but he's in many collections and I, I certainly enjoyed our working together. Peter Seekier, I was aware of Peter Seekier and his, uh, all the work that he did for Walker Evans, but um, I never really knew much about him. And this is the jacket for the book that I did called Signs of Life. Uh, Peter had started his career in the US as a, as a sign painter and he loved signs. And Walker once said that in another life, I think I would like to be a sign painter. So they shared that. One evening I had dinner with uh, friends of Walker and Brian Graham, a photographer from Nova Scotia. And he said that within the week, he'd helped a man clean out his apartment where he lived for 45 years. And the man was throwing out a lot of stuff and offered him these photographs. And so he had a stack of these. They're a little bit bigger than 11 by 14. There are, they are very cheap paper and on them are dry mounted, these small prints. And for the most part, this is all that remains of many of the images that Seekier made. Uh, I thought they should be in a museum right away and I had little or anything to do with it, but they wound up at the Addison and Jock Ren Reynolds very generously allowed me to bring a macro lens and I started copying these things. This was before scanning was as easy as it is now. And I, I wound up making a book and I took it to Gerhard Steidel, an eccentric, really wonderful genius printer in Göttingen. Uh, Gerhard prints for Robert Frank and Robert Adams and Jim Dye, and he's, he's a wonderful printer. And um, uh, he's a completely self-controlled man, and everything that goes on there is done by Gerhard. Anyway, we did the book together, and I... It is, but it, it's, it went through another iteration. Uh, this is an example of the difference between Seekure and, and Evans. The one on the left is a 35 millimeter photograph taken in a barber shop in Atlanta. The same barber shop was photographed by Walker, and it's an eight by ten photograph taken of two empty chairs. Um, while I was doing the thing with, the, the, I, we hadn't we hadn't finished it thing with Gerhard Steidel, but Julian Cox, who was the curator of photography at High Museum in Atlanta, I learned that he was putting together a collection for the museum of Peter Seekar material with Howard Greenberg. So um, Julian and I got together and he asked me to design the book. And I said, well, I've already designed the book. So we redesigned the book. And it was a good thing because I then had access to more material and I could scan and collect more things. And by this time, I'd become very in, involved in making digital files and correcting digital files. And, and the book really profited by it. Um, Francis Lindley and I, Walker's friend from Harper and Row, had for years tried to find an author for a biography. And with uh, the help of some friends, I, I met James Mello and he had done a, a really wonderful book on Gertrude Stein and her circle and one on Hemingway and he'd won a national book of award for his book on Hawthorne. And we talked about Walker and I, and I realized that he would be perfect to do this. And Jim worked on it for six or eight years and unfortunately he died before it was finished. But uh, it did get finished. and. I was working with an editor at um, uh, Harper and Row, and um, 
on what well, it was a subset of Harper and Rowe, but anyway, the, the young man had never heard of Rag Wright and he didn't know that type could be made. And we had a tug of war over it, but I finally decided it was really not worth the battle and we just went ahead and, and did the book. I, I worked very hard on the files because I knew it was going to be on uncoated paper. So I made the files a little bit more contrasty to accommodate that softness. And I think it turned out very well. This was also selected by the AIGA as a 50 book of the year. Um, you, you never know uh, what surprises are going to fall in, on your desk. Um, Cahiers in Paris in the 20s and 30s was the cutting edge publisher of avant-garde art. Christian Zervos was an art critic and he and his wife started this business of publishing these quarterlies. And they published Picasso, Matisse, Man Ray, uh, Calder, all of the major artists. And when, when Zervos died, it went dormant essentially. And then in about 2012 or 13, a very wealthy man walked by the shop and his family were art collectors. And he walked in knowing the reputation of, Kaidar means art notebook. Anyway, he walked in and he said, is this for sale? And they said, well, maybe. Well, anyway, within two or three days, he had bought the entire company with all of their inventory. He'd never done a book before. And he decided that he knew Sandy Rohr, grandson of Alexander Calder in New York. And they'd been talking. And I think Sandy Rohr convinced him to do a book on Calder because Calder had been part of the history of Gayadar. And so Alex Matter was, of course, a friend of um, uh, Herbert Matter and Alex and, and her, uh, Sandy Calder were friends from 1936 and, until he died. And they were, Herbert photographed everything he did. So all of those negatives had been given to the Calder Foundation. So I met with Sandy Rohr and he's a wicked, brilliant man. And I was blessed to get the job and one of the questions he asked me, and I think it may have turned the, turned the tide, was he said, do you know ballet? And I said, yes, I know ballet. And then he asked me a few more questions to see if we were talking about the same ballet. And it was the Alexei Brodovich Ballet from 1945. Anyway, um, it had to be done within a year. And I had access to all of the wonderful files that they had made. We did two versions, a, a special edition instead of a trade edition. This is the, this is the fa black fabric with the silk screen red rooster on it. This frontispiece had been used in an earlier publication and Sandy Rohr was very fond of it. I think it works very well as a frontispiece. Herbert understood Calder and they trusted each other completely. And it was, it was, you could see it in the work. Herbert interpreted these things and he knew how to light them and he knew how to make them really sing. This is Josephine Baker. And I'm sure all of these other two are portraits of recognizable figures. Herbert also did a wonderful film of Calder. And it was narrated by Burgess Meredith. The music was by John Cage. And Alvin Eisenman showed that I saw the film as an undergraduate at the University of Georgia. And then I came to Yale and Alvin Eisenman in the loft of his barn in Bethany, Connecticut. He showed this film in September every year to incoming students. It was such a, a great, it's a great film. And it, you, you still can get it. Um, this is um, a project that Sam Chauncey, who was the secretary of Kingman Brewster, initiated. Uh, Sam had gotten wind of the fact that the May Day 
meeting of the thing in with Bobby Seale and, and the Black Panthers was coming to be on the May Day in 1970, and the weathermen were coming, and everybody was expecting a bloodbath. And Sam spent three weeks developing a strategy that was successful in diverting all of that, and it really became more of a uh, not exactly a love fest, but it became a very peaceful thing. Anyway, Tom Strong, student of Walker Evans, student of mine, student of Norman Ives, uh, brought his camera the same day, and we were both there on the same day, and we photographed, but we photographed very different things. Sam, uh, Tom Strong did this wonderful crowd shot here that really captured the spirit of it. Uh, I did some pictures of Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and various other things. But um, these are all from the collection of Tom Strong. Sam Chauncey uh, convinced Henry Louis Gates Jr. to write the text for this. This is Tom Strong's photograph. As is this, this is an incredible shot of Broadway and all the boarded up signs. This is another example of a fancy men's shop with free pantries on it. This is John Hershey standing in front of one of the colleges. This is Jean Genet and uh, some young black New Haven citizens wearing badges saying, um, what does it say? Uh, anyway. Um, Ed Grosda is a very um, experienced photographer. He was a student, Harry Callahan. He's published a number of books with Powerhouse and he worked for um, many years in documenting the disappearing and decaying training posts in the Southwest. And with his help, we sequenced and put together this book which I, I think is really a, a wonderful record and, and, and truly a work of art. Um, Walker, kept, Walker Evans kept sort of popping up one way or the other. A, a, a very successful photo dealer in Cologne, Thomas Sonder, had a client who had collected a series of photographs of Labor Anonymous. And he wanted to showcase those for his client. And so uh, he asked me to design the book. The book is a very, we records a very important thing for a number of reasons. One, it is the second time that Walker, this is the end papers. These are notes that Walker made about the names of job, descrip job descriptions of worker employees employed in this plant. Um, so his, excuse me, his, um, his scheme was very much like the subway where he sat in a, in a subway car and photographed without looking into the camera, view, in the viewfinder of the camera. Here he's standing on a corner for several hours and as people go by, he doesn't look at his camera. He just clicks the shutter, knowing that he can edit and put together a series after that. He was obviously very excited about it, and he wanted um, Fortune magazine to, to do a number of pages. They wound up doing only two pages, but it really is an important idea. <clears throat> I mean, it's fun to hear it, the repetition, and it's really quite a wonderful piece. Um, I felt that, um, well, this is a catalog in a way, it's a book, but it's, it's also related to an exhibition that I did at the Florence Griswold Museum in, in, in Old Lyme, Connecticut in 2013. Dr. Heinz Liesbrock, who is head of the Joseph Albers Museum in Bottrop, Germany, quite often comes to Bethany, Connecticut to the Albers Foundation here. So we know each other a little bit. And I took him to see this exhibition at the Florence Griswold Museum. It was three rooms, much of them large prints that I had made, large digital prints, some of them that were 30 by 40 inches. 
And it was one of the, not the first time they'd been shown, but the first time they'd been shown in Connecticut. And it filled three large rooms. I had signs that Evans had collected. So I took Heinz to see the exhibition and I, just as an offhand remark, I said, why don't you, why don't we make a larger exhibition and take it to Bottrop to the Joseph Albers Museum? And he said, well, maybe that's possible. So we started working on this and we started working on the book at the same time we're doing the exhibition. The exhibition turned out to be the largest Evans exhibition ever mounted. We had over 150 lifetime vintage prints and we had something like 300 images on the wall. And the book was, uh, I thought it was a great opportunity to do a book. And here you see um, this wonderful quote from Walker saying, stare, it's the way to educate your eye and more. Stare, pry, listen, eavesdrop, die knowing something, you're not here long. So I decided that had to be on the cover. And I happened to have collected an uncut sheet from a printer of samples of eyeballs. And I thought this was perfect for something about staring. And I also thought it was exactly the kind of vernacular object that Walker would have liked. I got a tremendous amount of uh, people that were very angry about the idea of doing this. And I finally um, said to, to Dr. Lee's Brock and the publisher, I said, do you want to do this book? And they said, yes. I said, well, then this is your jacket. <clears throat> and then we compromised by making, because I did not have the name of the book on the cover of the book, on the, on the front cover. So we, we compromised and put a yellow belly band around it, which worked out just fine. Uh, in the beginning, I did sort of a smorgasbord of sampling of what was to come. Um, these are all self-portraits self by Walker, who happened to enjoy very much photographing himself. Um, early sort of constructivist things that he did. This is from the FSA. It's Joe's Auto Graveyard. You see this river of rusting cars going through a beautiful pasture. This is two examples of the subway photographs. It was, it was a remarkable series of pictures. But it, it helped move the idea of Walker away from just being in the uh, 1930s poverty. This is a eight foot sign. It was the backrest for a bus stop in Atlanta. And when he went to visit my brother, he said, you have to go and steal this sign for me. And uh, my brother, who was, very, was, was a very conservative man said, of course I'll do that. And, and, but anyway, one night after a party, he and his sister-in-law and brother-in-law went out with wrenches and uh, boats and they liberated this, this sign and it finally wound up in my hands and it finally wound up on the wall in Germany. It's a wonderful piece of vernacular art. It's about cars, which Walker adored. And anyway, the other thing is, nobody realized that Walker was really a colorist and had a natural sense of color. He did a, a little essay called Color Accidents or architectural form. These are only two pages. Late in his life, he discovered the SX-70 and Polaroid was delighted to send him as much film as he could possibly use. And he made over 3000 SX-70 photographs. And they're simple. They involve some of the same ideas, vernacular art, signs, strange architecture. It's, it's part and parcel of what he was. Bill Crawford was a student of Walker and a student of mine, and he went back and forth to Hanoi for over 30 years. And this 
is a wonderful book and I was so lucky to do it. Bill is an incredible writer, incredible photographer. He owes a lot to Eugene Ache and to Walker Evans. It was a great pleasure to do this book. Still Facing Infinity was a book by my neighbor and old friend, Irvin Hauer, somebody that I'd known for over 50 years. Irvin was head of the sculpture department at Yale and he asked me to cooperate with him to make this book. Erwin was a very good typographer himself. He was from, he was from Austria. Uh, and he's, he, I was so happy that he had a, a copy in his hand a few days before he died. Um, which brings us to the most complicated and to me, one of the most satisfying books that I've done and that is Norman Ives Constructions and Reconstructions. We met in September of 1958 and seemed to get along right away. Um, he was my teacher, my wife's teacher. Two families became very close. We spent holidays together. We had a lot in common. I worked together with him on a lot of projects. And I've always felt, as Walker Evans said, Norman Ives is not getting his due and someday I hope he will. So I'm hoping that this would make Walker happy. I had access, I had started the book about 20 years ago, but I didn't know how much I was missing. And then I discovered the archive in um, Dawestown, Pennsylvania, run, it's headed by my godson, John Ives. And this is not, this is related. It says to find a form that accommodates the mess. That is the task of the artist now. Well, I'm not calling the archive a mess, but it is, a, it is a very rich and overwhelming body of work. And to try to find a form that accommodates that was not so very, it was not so easy. This is the end papers, which I borrowed from an AIGA thing that that Norman had done, and they're done by a very uh, rare printing method. It's called potato prints. So this spells out A-I-G-A -A with fresh potatoes. These are early collages that Norman did, probably from sheets of alphabets that he had printed on the van der Kooke and cut up. These are gouache paintings done on tracing paper and they've never been seen and I still can't explain why anybody would put gouache on tracing paper but they're brilliant and they show a color sensibility and intensity that never made its way beyond this because this is much more typical two colors um, is got to be the, the sort of the norm and sometimes maybe three colors but this is Joseph Albers with Norman. They worked very close together and making a lot of, Norman had four careers. He was a fine artist in his own right. He was a teacher. He was a graphic designer and he was a publisher along with his classmate, Sewell Sillman, of boutique um, portfolios for major artists at the time. Uh, Norman self-published this little book called Eight Symbols in 1961. It's on Mohawk Superfine, it's printed on the Vandercook printing press at Yale. It was, the printer was Harm Ash, who was a wonderful printer. And these are four of the, the eight symbols. He did a fair amount of text for this book. And in it, he, he reveals how, how much he enjoys doing them, how he considers them when they are successful to be a pure gestalt, Nothing can be changed. It looks as though it was inevitable. And it's, it really is, it does characterize so much of Norman's work, his fine art and his, uh, his applied art. This is a Gertrude Stein paperback for the Yale University Press in a magazine cover. Um, he did several postage stamps, as you see. This is a Christmas card for the Boston Maine Railroad. Um, 
he and the family went to Mexico in the early 70s, late 60s. And there he started doing these series of um, circular paintings. These are gouache, varying in size from eight to 10 inches. They are overlaid letters and they, um, he brought them back and continued to make more of them. It's really a wonderful series. Um, working for architects was a natural sort of thing for him. And this is from the cinema complex in Orange, Connecticut, very near his house. And he did this for William Reisman Architects. It was a very large uh, lobby serving three theaters. And he made these 15 foot panels. There are four of them and they were images on both sides. So they were eight images altogether. Um, it didn't end well, but we later learned that even though they were destroyed, each one of these was repurposed from an earlier work that Norman had done. This was one of his latest, excuse me, latest mural sketches. And I think one of the most exciting things he did, this is an 11 by 14 Masonite sheet and on the back it says mural sketch. It's titled Duad. It was a series of a, a lot of things called Duad, uh, silkscreen prints, more paintings, but it has a energy and a, and a, and a impact on it. It's just hard to imagine, but it's also hard to imagine it. I, I'm tempted, I made a larger one of this for a wall in, at RIT. Um, anyway, um, we sort of come to the end here, and I think that um, what I said at the beginning sort of bears repeating again. If you have a project that you're passionate about, you should pursue it, and you shouldn't worry about the time or the funding, or will it get published or not? It probably will. Anyway, I don't want you to think that this is the last straw. I want to go back to Herbert Matter. This is a jacket or a draft of a jacket for a Herbert Matter book that I'm now working on. I'm very excited about it. Herbert was Norman's teacher. Herbert was my teacher. And I um, invite you to stay tuned. I, I think it's going to be great. Thank you very much. Oh, and thank you, John, uh, for sharing all of this with us and, and taking the time tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. And I, I know everyone on the, in the audience tonight appreciates it. Um, I do have a, a few questions that people um, uh, were, uh, typed in. Um, the first one, uh, I guess, is about the, uh, from Lisa Rizowski, uh, is about the uh, Walker Evans books, uh, and she's wondering um, who made uh, the separations for the, the duotones in, in those? Oh, I made the digital files. Uh, the first one was um, Hungry Eye, or that was one of the first ones. That was, those, those were made by Thomas Palmer. I had contracted Richard Benson to do it, and he immediately passed it off to his colleague, Thomas Palmer. So Thomas Palmer did the um, negatives for uh, Hungry Eye. Um, I did, after that, I think I did most of the digital files myself. I, I enjoy doing digital works. I enjoy doing digital printing. And I, I've gotten to be at least adequate in doing it. OK. Um, and then uh, I'm going to sort of paraphrase the next one here. Um, uh, this is from Nate Love. Uh, he's asking um, uh, about photography books, um, how you, uh, what, what thought process goes into determining the trim size for? for well, that's a great question, isn't it? Um, well, I sometimes, I, I, I have been guilty of making things that a, a half an inch or three quarters of an inch bigger than I would have had I, but I always have a, a bulk dummy made up. And I like the, uh, this doesn't answer that question, but I like the squarish format because it's very democratic. It, it gives d verticals and horizontals the same sort of real estate. But uh, it's hard to know that. I, I don't like to do very small photographic books because I think the access to the information, especially in 
in the work of somebody like Walker Evans, where the information and the detail and information is so vital, uh, I think that they need to be a certain size. And I would think 10 and a half, 10 and three quarters. And I've pretty much stuck to that. Okay. Uh, and, and what is probably a related question uh, from Edgar Cardenas, um, uh, he's asking about uh, how you make decisions um, in layout uh, for, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through this here. Um, so how do you, how, uh, what thought process goes into you um, deciding which image would get a single page, or I guess he's asking more like, uh, how do you decide which images to cross over the gutter and do like two page spread? Well, crossing over the gutter is, is, is an anathema and sort of sac sacrilegious move in a lot of people's mind. But I feel that if you do it uh, thoughtfully and you accommodate the loss of the material in the gutter, um, the trade off of getting a larger image with more impact and more information available is worth the um, downside, I guess. Uh, how do you decide that? It's visceral, it's gut. I, I can't always put words to that. It's case by case. Okay. Um, and I'm just seeing if we have a couple more. Uh, we have one from um, Amy King uh, asking if you've um, ever had to had a book produced for uh, as an ebook, digital, or, or for a tablet. I I um I think May Day, the book that we did there was done as a digital book. And I don't think it sold very well, but I do believe that was available and may still be available through Perspective Press as a digital book. That's the only one I can think of. Okay. But I like the idea. Um, and uh, Chris Steinauer is asking uh, if you have any insights into the friendship between Evans and Agee. Evans and Agee? Yeah. My God, uh, <laughs> that's, a, a, that's a very intense subject. Um, they were very close and um, Walker told me one day, he said, every day I miss Jim. I mean, they really were bonded on the deepest sort of level and they understood each other and the, their work together was interesting because you have this vitriolic text with this very cool body of imagery. So they work together and balance each other perfectly. Okay. Um, and then uh, one more, uh, which I think is a, a good one to ask is where, um, where can we uh, purchase these books? I mean, where would you prefer that we purchase them? I could say. Well, I have uh, <laughs> some interest. Or I'm interested in your purchasing the Eyes book through the Eyes Foundation, which you can do on the Eyes website. But you can produce, you can buy that book and any number of these others on Amazon and Google, and they're they're pretty available now. Okay, um, and I think that's it for questions. Uh, so. Uh, just once again, I wanted to thank you again for uh, for sharing all this with us. I, I, I know it was deeply appreciated by everyone. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you in the Printer Society for inviting me. Of course. All right. Well, I, I guess we'll sign off now. And uh, thanks again to uh, John T. Hill and and Chris Pullman for the introduction. <laughs> thanks for the tea, <laughs> Alex. Thanks for the tea. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Good night. Good night. Good night.